Now we have um, Sir John Elder and his paper is Dwelling on the Edge. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here on the occasion of the launch of Connemara and Elsewhere, a book celebrating the superb achievements of Tim Robinson in his career as a writer here in Western Ireland. I, I too, like, like, like many here, want to express my appreciation for the university, for the Royal Irish Academy, most of all to Jane Conroy for her role in envisioning and bringing to fruition uh, the volume and this uh, event uh, celebrating uh, the, the launch. Um, I'd like to uh, build as far as I can. I've had the pleasure of hearing all the other, the other speakers in the symposium now, and, and they've, they've made so many interesting points. So as I can, I'd like to weave a few of those points in here uh, in my, in my um, presentation. Uh, one of them came out of uh, one, one point I'd like to build in right from the start is from Nicolas Feve, who talked about the need um, with this uh, landscape orientation uh, volume in order to see the entirety of a panorama, to hold it up, look at it uh, from some distance, and just hold the middle page, the dividing page, so that you could see the extension of the panorama on both sides. And I'd like to play a similar uh, game with uh, two perspectives on Tim Robinson's work. If we think of uh, The Stones of Aaron, his two-volume masterpiece about the Aran Islands and his Konamara trilogy, which so excitingly extended uh, that work as a single map laid edge to edge, uh, and which is then set on the floor, weighted down with books so that it lies flat while we look at it from our full heights. What we would see is a world of shores. Shores, uh, Tim has a, a very strong predilection for shores, which you might imagine. Uh, for a person who's uh, spent uh, the better part of four decades uh, focused on uh, a group of islands and a peninsula. It's a world in which um, outlines and enclosures are the larger message of his work. Each island and the <coughs> peninsula enclosed within its own dramatic and distinctive coastline. But there's another perspective I want to I want to um, group with that one in thinking about uh, Robinson's work. Now imagine us lying down on the floor with our faces just inches above that map, propped up on our elbows perhaps as if we were reading the Sunday paper on a sunny rug. At this point, that earlier sense of outlines and enclosures gives way to intricacy, reversals of those black lines, pulsing, bubbling now rather than gliding smoothly around the shores. My sense is that these two uh, contrasting perspectives uh, are, are part of our flicker of experience as we read through Tim Robinson's writings from Western Ireland. We move suddenly from a lofty overview to the tangled inwardness of an edge. This rhythm is essential for me to reading Tim Robinson's work. And there are two questions I would like to consider in connection with this phenomenon. The first is, and this complements the historical and the philosophical and the documentary and the scientific perspectives of the, of the previous uh, very engaging uh, uh, presentations. One is aesthetic, psychological, and emotional. What's the relationship in these terms between Tim Robinson's elegant prose and masterful scientific overview on the one hand and the scenes in which he relates his stumbling, halting progress through the ever-shifting scales of a broken shore. And the second question I have has to do with us at this aesthetic and emotional level as readers. How, and to me, more interestingly yet, why does a reader follow him through such suspect terrain? Well, in order to get at these two questions, I'd like to focus on a fairly small passage my microcosm, to use one of Robinson's favorite words. It's the preface called Fractal Connemara to section three of Connemara, a little Gaelic kingdom. Robinson begins this, the question, uh, begins the, the, the preface with a question. How long is the coast of Connemara in which he echoes a famous essay by Benoit Mandelbrot? He begins by imagining 
a map of one inch to a mile, and I'm going to remember, I never use these screens, but I thought, what an opportunity. Uh, at the beginning of, of that volume, Konamara, A Little Gaelic Kingdom, uh, he has a map, this map of Konamara. And so I put it up there, even though it may not be at exactly the same scale that he's about to talk about. In fact, his large folding landscapes map of Konamara is at one inch to one mile. And so think of this as a stand-in for that, whether or not it's exactly the same scale. He writes, on a map of one mile to one inch, I can open a pair of compasses or dividers to uh, one inch and step walk them along the line rec representing the high water mark, including as many offshore islands as possible. My map gives me a shoreline distance of 64 miles. But then he analyzes what would happen if he, if he went to a six inch per mile map, and so that now the one inch wide division of his, of his uh, compass represented a sixth of an inch. And also now there are so many more little headlands and, and bluffs and inlets that he can measure. They're big enough to measure now. So he steps it around with more, more uh, variety in his line and comes up with a, with a conclusion that this coastal length now is 130 miles. It's all, it's all a matter of, uh, of scale. Next, he imagines a map of 25 inches per mile. So we're, we're beginning to get dizzy here. We're falling, we're falling down a well. And if that weren't enough, he says, and now let's think of Konamara as an island so that we can try to estimate its area. And of course, an island is not flat. It's pyramidal in shape. And every line you climb up it is like a shoreline with all of its irregularities. Here's the quite wonderful passage where he evokes uh, going up and down the, sh the inward shores of pyramidal island Konamara. The slanting sides of the pyramid are, of course, complicated by cliffs and gullies, and these by jutting rocks and sheep-worn paths, all these surfaces being grooved and pitted and rough with crystals, and so on down to the craggy microcosms an ant has to toil over. All these features immeasurably increase one's estimate of the island's area, and there is no obvious stopping place in this hopeless pursuit of accuracy. It's, it's a really wonderful passage. And I'd like to pause here, although Tim uh, uh, does not pause himself. He barrels right along, because it speaks to uh, my two framing questions. For one thing, this passage illuminates the fact that in closing uh, that the enclosing cir circumambulation of shores and the exploding uh, attentiveness to the pitted and grooved edges of the area that's being enclosed always press up against our feet, are, uh, both of them, the circumference and the inwardness, are always both infinitely expansive. It becomes a world that never ceases to expand in whichever direction we go in response both to our outward and outward reflection and to our ever closer attentiveness. The pursuit of accuracy from that perspective is hopeless. His pilgrimage around Aaron Moore in the first volume of Stone's pilgrimage was followed by his negotiation of the island's complex interior in Labyrinth, its successor. Oh, by the way, I just realized I didn't show you the other map, did I? This is as you get down to a smaller scale. Uh, imagine I put that up when I talked about six inches to a mile, and, and it'll all work perfectly. So, so anyway, we, 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 we go up, uh, we go around in pilgrimage, we go through in labyrinth. When you get to Konamara, in my opinion, to the trilogy, there's more of a shuttle back and forth between the lofty and the, and the microscopic perspective, though toward the end it's tending back down once more to the infinitesimal and infinite shore. My sense is that going to the edge, going to the extremes here, again and again, are a way to move comprehensively toward registering the world's wholeness and its grandeur. And in this regard, I remember John Wiley's uh, comments about the, the uh, landscape paintings of, of Claude, where you go from the foreground to the middle ground to the, to the uh, far distant uh, perspectives. In, in Tim Robinson's writing, it seems to me you veer between the distant and the uh, very immediate as a way finally to collapse from the world of measurement into the immediacy, the presentness, momentarily at least, of a non-counted 
non-quantifiable, immeasurable world. I think of the quote from Robin Kelsey, which Professor Wiley uh, shared with us about the fantasy of not belonging to the totality of life as a terrestrial experience. For me, for the writer, I believe, and certainly for me as a reader in the work of Tim Robinson, falling down from the heights and through the edge into ever uh, more receding uh, and microcosmic complexity is a way to, to discover, indeed, the world's strangeness, to rest at least for a moment in the unmeasured boundlessness of the world. I think of, in, in this regard, I think of uh, Tim Robinson in relation to uh, the, the Irish uh, monks who uh, sought the farther edge of Europe when they wanted to emulate the desert fathers. They wanted to find their own rocky desert. And when they got to the edge, they kept going. They got in their little strangely round boats and paddled out into the main Atlantic. They went to the edge as their launching place for a journey to the center of a concentric universe. I think edges for, for them and for Tim Robinson alike are such zones for launching, such zones for rediscovering the strangeness and in its strangeness the momentarily at least unaccountable reality of our lives in this world. And now for the second of that framing, th those framing questions with which I began the, the how and the why of how a reader is drawn, why a reader is drawn into Tim Robinson's journey into the realm of crystalline microcosms. One way I can explain the way these books feel to me is with reference to the word sublime. Um, Edmund Burke, uh, of course, is the reference for us uh, in, uh, in scholarship and literature within the English language. Uh, in, his, in his essay in the mid-18th century on the origins of our ideas of the beautiful and the sublime, he spoke of the sublime as a world of the, uh, uh, the vast, vast beyond all all of our accounting, the highest mountains, the deepest oceans, a world in which we felt our infinitesimal, uh, insignificant uh, uh, being as human individuals. It's the kind of world, the sublime, that you come upon in nature, in mountains and, uh, and in, uh, in the sea, as I've said. In art, you come upon it in works like the Book of Job, King Lear, or Guernica, works that leave us mute, uh, numb, really, with their grand, with their dark, and dangerous grandeur. But if, if the sublime makes us feel vanishingly small, it also, and simultaneously, expands the world so vastly that it increases our space for adventuring and our possibility for discovery. I think this not only has been uh, the ethic that informs uh, much of the, the nature writing that I've been interested in, the, uh, the authors like uh, Henry Thoreau and John Muir and, and Annie Dillard, but it also uh, informs a lot of the language and the experience of people pursuing extreme sports like uh, mountaineering or uh, surfing giant waves. They're seeking, they're seeking that kind of experience. And there's a literary equivalent of it for me in the yawing and the dramatic falling from scale to scale that is experienced in, um, uh, in Tim Robinson's work. When he, when he writes of the hopeless pursuit of accuracy, that language is finally both an expression of limitation and also an opportunity for transcendence. We come to the edge of a boundless sea encircling an inexhaustible planet of stumbling possibi st possibilities. Uh, Nicholas Fev talks about uh, the disappointment, which is our inevitable uh, fate when we try to reach the horizon. I think it is a little different with shores, though. We can stand on the shores even though the tide sometimes recedes from us and sometimes washes up around our ankles. And at that edge, we can, we can think about where we are in a less abstract way. Well, after the passages I've already read from the preface, uh, Tim Robinson turns to Benoit Mandelbrot, uh, who's given us the language of fractals from the Latin fractus for broken that also informs uh, modern science of, uh, of chaos. Mandelbrot is, is interested, as, uh, as Robinson is, in phenomena, and now this is quoting from Tim Robinson, such as coastlines that exhibit a degree of self-similarity over a range of scales and are therefore too complicated to be described in terms of classical geometry, which would indeed regard them as broken, confused, tangled, unworthy of the dignity of measure. Um, let's see now. I'm going to go to another slide. 
Oh, I have to go back. That's right. You can see I'm not a techno whiz. Oh, no, that's good. That's the one. This is, this is a, a, a little diagram that Tim Robinson includes uh, in the preface from, from Mandelbrot. Mandelbrot. It's an example of the way fractals work, and it's a stepwise pattern. So imagine a, a, a line going from left to right. You go, and then you step up, and you step down. Oops. And then you, you go across, and you come back to the line. So it's, it's, it's stepwise. Step up, step down, keep going. Now you can take that fractal, that basic uh, model, and in effect, you can apply its code to that top scale so that you have the, the stepwise fashion into each of the long lines in the top scale. And then you can apply the same code to that middle diagram so you get the more elaborated lower one. It's a beautiful, a beautiful pattern. And as we get down to the bottom, we begin to see something of the intricacy of a coastline, uh, which, which uh, Tim Robinson so well describes. It's a kind of... Uh, efflorescence of, of texture and of pattern and of self-similarity. This is what allows us to look at um, the, the natural entities. Uh, again, this is, uh, this is Tim Robinson's language. From coastlines to curdled milk. That's perhaps my favorite phrase of this presentation. Um, and it's his, of course. Systems of arteries, bundles of geological faults, cloud forms even the distribution of the 200 billion galaxies in space. In other words, things that, that seemed random or evanescent or simply uh, uh, chaotic now, now move within a larger logic of chaos, which is self-replication over varying scales. It's, for me, psychologically, emotionally, just as uh, the testimony of one reader, the, it's related to the excitement of reading Tim Robinson, who so concretely evoke such systems because we, we move uh, through a world that seems to leave our counting and measurement behind and fall into the immediacy of a world in which there is, in fact, order. It's not immediately measurable, but we can perceive it as we fall from scale to scale and see relics, see familiarity wherever we end up. The hopeless pursuit of accuracy, a phrase I'm returning to, I promise you, for the last time, is related to this realization of the world's ultimate immeasurability. It's a prologue to resting, at least for a moment, now and then, in the ungraspable, but everywhere repeated and disclosed whirl of complex systems to which we belong, but which we can never completely uh, comprehend. For the reader, or at least for this reader, I'm trying to turn this off now and see. Had it the I thought I'd remove this. Uh, image, but thank you, Michael, in advance for doing that. Um, so for, for this reader, there's something redemptive about falling through the finely calibrated edge into a universe beyond or, or beneath uh, the scale where our senses work. That's the point. If we go out far enough into intergalactic space, there's nothing for us to see. We don't have the right eye to see it with. If we go down below the, the submicroscopic, similarly, we don't have a sense or even an instrument that allows us to see. Uh, what is there. What a relief. This has something to do with arriving at the wordless state of wonder, deeper than all the prayers and the practices which the ancient monks pursued at uh, unbelievable places like Skellig Michael, was the practice of contemplation, the wordless sense of being at one with all that is. This is, this is a moment that no one, not even the most uh, devout monk, can hold on, hold on to for very long, but we can arrange at least to pass through it from time to time, some perhaps by going down to the shore. Though, though Tim Robinson is absolutely clear about the centrality of atheism to his own perspective, I take courage in drawing this religious connection from the fact that he too, interestingly and continuously employs religious and biblical language in his own published writings. And I'll be turning to an example of one of these, these uh, references very, very shortly. He was a gifted student of mathematics and, and geometry and admitted to study maths at Cambridge. And right from there, through his work as an artist in London in the 1970s, his mind and his canvas were always swarming and overwhelmed with Euclidean forms. Here's how he describes this aspect of experience in a very remarkable, not yet published essay called Parallax. Quoting now, pity the St. Sebastians of geometry. 
Isn't that a great phrase? Pity to say Sebastian's of geometry. Right angles, triangles, parallel lines, tangential contacts. Pour in upon them and pierce them. These forms are generated by points. The exact center of a round mirror, a fly in the wall, a far off chimney top, the first star of evening, an evanescent crank in the profile of a cloud. Points of light or darkness, rays seen endways on, compose themselves restlessly into nameless patterns, diagrams, theorems, pictures. When the thorn bush outside my window begins to fill with incompatible geometries, as with gibbering monkeys, it is time to draw the curtain. Well, I'll draw a line at, this, at, at that point across my, my little presentation and say, having focused now as, as uh, fruitfully as I could on a little, a little a patch of the preface, I'd like to conclude this uh, presentation with a couple of speculative codas. Uh, uh, Perhaps they're like the sidesteps in the fractal we saw, but I hope, I hope uh, adding at least texture to the whole presentation. The first one has to do with the notion of, the, of edges. Obviously, edges come into Tim Robinson's work, edges at the shore, edges, cognitively speaking, logical edges. But ecologists have another very interesting way of thinking about edges. They, they use the word edge or ecotone for the boundary between adjacent ecosystems. It's, the it's a very precarious thing because edges move, like uh, the, the tides at a rocky shoreline, like the, the place where uh, an abandoned uh, pasture gives way to, to the forest as the sumac and pine come into it. They're always moving. Animals who go into an edge can be nourished. They can, they can find life more abundant, but they can also simply find themselves lunch because they don't, they're not as familiar with the ter terrain. They're not as familiar with the competition or the potential predators. And having said that, the precariousness of edge, edges goes along with the fact that, biologically speaking, they are the richest of all environments on Earth. They tend to have species from both adjacent habitats, as well as some unique to the edge itself. So for me, it's a very nice uh, way of thinking about uh, the literary effect, for me, as I say, the aesthetic and emotional effect of Tim Robinson's work. You have such a grand perspective, and you have such an infinitesimally uh, honed active attentiveness that finally uh, finds its pursuit hopeless. Between those two edges, but, excuse me, between those two habitats is, the, is another sense of edge, the ecotone, where what ecologists call edge effect prevails. Edge effect is this, is this effect of unique richness. It's the effect of the immediacy into which we fall, uh, into which we're, we're thrown, that thrownness, that betweenness, to go back to the discussion of, of Heidegger, that, that um, wakes us up momentarily to the strangeness of our world and lets us perceive it sensually and, um, and viscerally. I think that, the, that betweenness is the substance of Tim's book and the infinitely large and small are the walls of the, of the billiard table around which we carom. And the second speculation I'd like to, I'd like to offer you and, and with which I'll, I'll um, uh, conclude relates to that image of the monkeys in the thorn tree. I, I, that it, what, the, what, can, what the monkeys in the thorn tree reminded me of is, is some reading I've been doing lately in uh, Montaigne because um, Finally, what's interesting about uh, th this book that I haven't touched on yet is its tone. Uh, just as with those gibbering monkeys, there's something extravagant, and I find amusing, uh, constantly bubbling up uh, out of this book. It relates to, it relates to uh, Tim Robinson's uh, uh, sense of humor arising out of his uh, formidable intelligence and crystalline observations. And it can, for me at least, it, it can make him feel as silly and extravagant as Monty Python, or to, or to perhaps a better analogy might be to compare him to the protagonists of, of uh, Golden Age English children's literature. Because after all, what does he spend his time doing? Bicycling around, walking, and striking up conversations with strangers, turning over rocks, and asking what the story about those is. He reminds me of Winnie the Pooh going around poking his stick into holes in the tree or, into, or in, the, in the ground, wondering if anybody's at home, you know, or to, or to a rat and mole messing about in boats, or in, in Tim's case, messing about on bikes, or to uh, Alice dreaming her way through a long 
golden summer's afternoon, although perhaps that image is not as useful on Connemara. Uh, dream yourself through a driving rain and a, an impenetrable fog, perhaps. So, so, so there he is, striking up conversations and uh, poking along the path, which is finally, I think, and this is what the reader feels as well, a path of adventure and discovery. I think this tone is very important because the, the ideas we've all been talking about are appropriately very heady. The patterns are intricate and, and commanding and absorbing. But along the way, uh, there's fun as well. One word for this process of adventure and discovery is play. Though I might, I might qualify it uh, in the words of Robert Frost as play for mortal stakes. And the appropriate term for this kind of writing, writing the issues from a, a process of investigation and real discovery, not that begins with reporting on some prior discovery, where the discovery is embedded in the writing. The real term for this kind of writing is the essay. And, and as it happens, while thinking about this, this wonderful occasion, I was reading a new biography of, of Montaigne and have had him in my mind as the person who taught us how to move toward this kind of playful act of discovery in the form of writing. Uh, the, the, the essays of Montaigne are, are so apparently random. He begins, it, it can be anything from stories he's been reading about cannibals to his cat to how, what side he sleeps on to uh, sex. It, it all comes in. You never know what he's going to talk about next. And the wonderful thing is you, you read along and you think, I am following another life day by day. You have the authenticity of the voice. It's such a reminder, I have to say, as a fairly recently retired uh, teacher, it's a reminder that in schooling our students and ourselves in writing, uh, we should not limit ourselves to encouraging them to have a clear point, develop it in a forceful, orderly way, su supply persuasive evidence, and round it off with a reiterative flourish. There's something about that writing that's valuable, but it leaves out the possibility of grand discovery. And finally, what essay means is an attempt, a foray, a path toward discovery rather than simply a report. Actually, I'm, I've been working on this uh, just, just over there while I was being introduced. I changed the title. The, the real title of my talk is Essaying the Edge. <laughs> so here's a passage from Montaigne that, that uh, reminded me, or I was reminded of by the, by the part about the monkeys in the thorn bush, which I just read a couple of nights ago. He's describing sitting at his desk with his cat sitting on the desk, looking him in the eye. It's a famous passage. When I play with my cat, who knows if I am not a pastime to her, more than she is to me. We entertain each other with reciprocal monkey tricks. If I have my time to begin or to refuse, so has she. Obviously, it's the monkey tricks here that were brought to mind by, the, by Sebastian's thorn tree. But more than that, the writer's playful encounter with a cat who, is at once, who at once possesses her own reciprocal consciousness and is finally unknowable by him illustrates, I think, the possibilities for any encounter with a vibrant, inexhaustible edge. In other words, as Tim Robinson walks around the, the, the shores of, of Konamara, they're walking around too. They're, they're not just sitting there. They're, they're moving, and they're, and they're swelling out, and they're receding just as he steps around, sometimes in parallel, sometimes stopping, sometimes turning back. And the same thing happens with the reader. We're all kind of, uh, we're all kind of uh, meandering uh, together, uh, influenced by each other's meander, but never exactly stepping in the same places. The world at which we gaze, in refusing to be measured in any final and authoritative way, stares back at us the whole time. I, and I can't help thinking of the line from Taxi Driver, you looking at me? It's kind of a truculent thing, the coast of Konamara. Uh, and in a fractal world, surfaces are always sliding apart. We can't count on them. We fall through them into a new disabling, but also illuminating scale. And then we dust ourselves off to see what we can see before we've decided that we know what's there. So returning one last time to the question of what's in Tim Robinson's writing for a reader, I'd have to add that in addition to its powers of expanding and unifying our world, it has an enlivening effect. Just as he stumbles 
into new angles on the world in a continuous process of discovery, so too do we. Our experience uh, mirrors and ricochets off his. To quote once more from Robert Frost by way of rounding off, no surprise in the writer, no surprise in the reader. Thanks.